Okay, so we're recording now. Um, we're starting with our keynote speaker. Then uh, Jason will uh, give a talk about the research software directory and what it is and the team. Then we'll have a short break. And then Martina will give a talk about uh, research software at Utrecht University. Then uh, we have our collaborator, Christian Mesa from Helmholtz, who gives a talk about the RSD at Helmholtz. Um, if we then still have time for, for general discussion, uh, we will pick some questions for the chat, or if there's uh, space, uh, people can raise some hands. And then at the end, we'll go into a demo and Q&A session, um, which is more practically focused how to get started uh, with the research software directory for your organization or group. Um, so that is the program. I'll stop sharing now. And then it is my great pleasure to announce our um, keynote speaker, Marta Hornix, um, who's a professor at the Technical University of Eindhoven. So um, Marta, please go ahead and share your slides. Thank you very much, Maika. I will share my screen. Mm. And is every, if everything is well, then you see the first slide of my screen right now. Yes, we well, can see it. I'm very excited to be a, a, present, a presenter here today at this launch. I'm really excited about the research software directory. And I hope that the ones of you that don't know it that well, and uh, I'm here to see what it is about, uh, will become as excited as I am about it um, uh, this afternoon. Um, I will present you a story. It's a, it's a story of me as an uh, as a scientist, and uh, I have titled it "Unlocking the Impact Potential of Research Software." <clears throat> it's a personal story, so that means that uh, there could be some views of me that are personal. It could be that you have different views, but at least I hope that it gives you some some food for thought, some things to uh, digest. And also, uh, I hope at least that you get a little uh, inspiration after you have seen uh, my talk. So daily, I am working as an acoustician at Eindhoven University of Technology. So I'm working with sound, sound indoors, sound outdoors, and um, my expertise is to, um, to study how the environment influences sound. So you can think about the, the concert halls, how the room influences sound, lecture halls, but also outdoors. So it has several purposes, these studies, um, but one of them is health. If you think about noise, or if you think about um, classrooms where you talk for a long time. And um, things that we do is develop software to calculate this influence to calculate sound propagation, basically. Recently, a colleague of me has presented uh, on a conference on room acoustic simulation software. So that this software that is predicting how good a space is with respect to sound for speech or music. Here you see a question he asked to the audience in, in his plenary talk. And he asked, what is your confidence level of your simulations? You see that a very small minority has very high confidence level of that software. And he raised another question. And the other question was, what are the main problems? Well, it's very um, small uh, uh, text uh, font sizes. So the problems are input uncertainty in the model, the quality of the method itself, but also the lack of understanding of the models by the users. So the development of these methods, that is things that we do at a university, for example, in my group. Um, but the users are engineers, people working in industry, consultants. So, well, there is, this is very clear, this question makes very clear that we need better simulation methods, but we also need better understanding of the models by the users. So 
in my field, there's a clear impact potential for sharing research software. And currently we have software, but that's commercial software that is not connected to universities. So there's commercial parties that develop software, but that is often not regarded as scientific software. So that is what's happening in my field. So a bit more about me. So I'm a, I'm a full professor in building acoustics. Uh, almost 20 years I'm working in this field um, as a scientist, of course, also as an educator at all levels uh, of academia. And I study how the environment influences sound, mostly with computational techniques. So that's also why I'm interested in research software, why we develop research software. Uh, the team I work in that I lead is about 15, 15 researchers. And internationally, we have a we have a quite good position in our field. Uh, interesting enough, uh, I'm a rookie on GitHub. So if you if you uh, find me on GitHub, you'll see I'm not the person that is sharing most there. The story will come today, so please hang on. And I'm also an eScience Center fellow. And also during my presentation later on, uh, you will see uh, why, and that is the case, and also what I'm doing as a fellow. So I'm a professor, but I'm also a Vice Dean Research in our department of the built environment. So in one of the nine departments of our university in Eindhoven, I'm the Vice Dean. And so I'm, I'm well, working in the middle management, you could say, uh, at, a, at a university. Um, that part of my work, I also like a lot. Uh, in our department, we are in a transition. So we are moving as a department towards more thematic research yeah, in the built environment that is related to energy transition. It's related to sustainability, and that has impact on how we organize ourselves in research and education. Personally, I'm very much interested in how research practice in our university is, how the culture is, the community. So in essence, as a vice dean research, I'm not, I'm not talking to my colleagues on what research they should do, but how they do it. And that is um, something I'm really much interested in. For that purpose, I also initiated a talent program. Later this week, there will be a news item on that that I also will share. It's a program that has several purposes. One purpose is to uh, improve the research community in our department, to create a better community also of sharing work together. So that is a bit about me. And as a vice dean, I'm also looking around because I'm responsible for the research assessment. And I'm active, taking active roles at a university in that as well. Well, uh, what is happening around us in, in the university, in the bigger picture, is that science is in transition. In the Netherlands, there is quite much going on at the moment. Some years ago, there was this document, Room for Everyone's Talent, which is a document, an underlying document to um, modify, to change the way we recognize researchers in universities. And there's actually four um, uh, pillars behind it that you see on this page. One is related to focus on quality. So instead of quantity or instead of having a focus on quantity, the shift should be more towards quality. There has, of course, been a lot of debate around it. Uh, maybe you recognize that uh, our NWO, the Dutch Research Council, does not ask any longer for uh, citation metrics, but for narratives. But that's that's the whole story on itself. Um, there's a focus on achieving team balance in science, not focusing on the best scientist in a certain field, but looking what a team needs to do the work in the best way to create the, the highest impact. Stimulation on open science goes without saying for this community, open data, open research software, open access publications, um, and everything related to that, it's stimulated. Also a stimulated academic leadership with all um, things that have happened in the media in the past month related to social safety. It is not a surprise that this also needs much attention. So there is quite much going on around this. As I already mentioned, as a vice dean, I'm responsible for the research assessment. 
And well, uh, there is an, uh, a protocol that we should follow. And traditionally, what we already should do, that's here in the, in the, in the flower, um, the quality, the viability and societal relevance. But there's more that, adds, that recently has been added onto that academic culture, PhD policy, open science and human resources and policy. So there's much more that, that research institutes and academic institutes should, um, should consider if they, uh, regarding their, their practice of research. Personally, I like this transition a lot. And the, one reason is that um, what we do all together in research should have impact. Uh, we should address the societal challenges that are um, out um, in the world related to climate, related to um, inclusivity, related to uh, sustainability, digitization of processes around it. And it's that impact that we together generate. And if you look back to this science in transition, that is all related to how we can better organize impact. So personally, my vision is that scientific research should be a joint effort to increase knowledge, of course, to contribute to science and to contribute to society. And from my point of view, the impact is the most important thing. So um, it's the results, the impact that we should chase rather than, for example, internal competition. And we should organize science in a way that this impact is mass maximized in a responsible way. And again, in this transition to science, in team science, uh, in sharing science, this organizing science towards maximizing impact is really happening. So I am one of the persons that is promoting this transition very much. Okay, but like, let's look to, to my research story. So I've been trained as a researcher, so as a master student, PhD student, postdoc, um, about two decades ago, 15 years ago. Um, and what I did is I developed in my PhD period a methodology to calculate how sound propagates in cities, in streets, in a very detailed way, very sophisticated calculation method. Well, the training was, well, very good on the quality. So I, I received very good training. Um, and the focus was with that training to, to publish my results in the PhD thesis, in scientific papers and at conferences. But at that time, there was no system to share data, to share software, to share papers in an open way. Um, yeah, we went to libraries or to, um, to, uh, to read the papers. Uh, and of course, that moved to online papers. Of course, people did share something. I got some piece of, of code from colleague at that time or for other colleagues, but there was no system. So it was on an individual basis how, how much people wanted to share in terms of software and data. Then when I defended my PhD thesis um, in Sweden, did my PhD in Sweden, my opponent there, he said, Wow, that's a great piece of software. Why don't you why don't you hire someone to share it? I said, well, I thought then at that time that was 2009. That was a great idea. So what I did is I wrote um, a grant, a career integration grant, to do that, to acquire funding for making the software openly available. It was quite well like valued software in my in my uh, community. I did that. So um, I hired persons to do that um, together with me, Python implementation, and uh, Blender was used as an interface. Mm, it's called OpenPSTD. It's uh, on GitHub. There's a website and we published a lot around this, this method with applications. Well, it's downloaded regularly. It's now since I think a couple of days also the research software directory, which you will that directory that you will hear much more about. So yeah, all good news, but um, well, not really. Um, so we moved on because well, this Blender interface, it's nice, but it, it has a lot of fuzz around. So I wanted an, an own interface and also the acceleration that we already had on GPU was nice, but it only in that time with, with Python, we could not have multiple cores 
So we said, okay, let's move to C++. I, hold, I hired other people to do that for me. We build an own interface, but then we got stuck. Um, and there are several reasons for that. Um, the C++ language, of course, for accelerating purposes was great. Um, but in my own lab, the researchers, they did not master that language. They mastered MATLAB and maybe a bit of Python. Um, and also, well, we did publish this things, um, but I did not really have the skills and also the awareness how to attract people to it. I was already happy that I published that online, that I shared it, but how to attract a community, how to activate a community and retain them, I did not know how to do that. Um, the people that I hired were students from computer science. They were excellent students, but they didn't have experience. So they, they developed something, but surely um, the sustainability of what they developed and also how much they reached in the development, well, that was limited. They had too little experience. The people in my group also did not have the culture to contribute to sustainable research software. So it came a bit too early, um, despite all efforts that we put on it and all things that we learned. So then it was around 2019, years later, and um, in these methods and other, other software develop, an important thing is to accelerate, to accelerate the software on GPU infrastructure. So I was looking for a call to do that, and I found the European, at the European level, I found a call um, about exascale computing, and I said, oh, wow, that's great. Maybe that's an opportunity for us. But what I realized, something needed to change in my research field. When I was looking at other research fields at that time, they had shared flagship codes, like in the geophysics um, community. They have this cheese um, center of excellence. They have a community around software that they together um, share, maintain, which is different from my community. We have quite some groups in my field that develop software, but it's fragmented. It's still a bit, um, we're, we're a bit behind. So I, I, then I realized that in my field, I need to do something more to, to reach uh, the next step. So what I, meant, what I noticed is that research software is locked in my field at least. Uh, and maybe some of you recognize uh, items that also apply to your field. And there's some barriers to that research, to this uh, to this locked software. Well, there's a lack of incentives. Uh, well, traditionally, this is also the way I was trained. Scientific publications are value. It's the publications that count, the impact of the citation that count. Research software is not is not really valued in that way. It's not in that system. So why should you spend time on sharing research software and 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 cleaning up codes to share? It's the, the publication that count. It's also a cultural thing. Um, there is protection of software in institutes. Well, if we protect software, then we are the first institute to, to advance the software and to write the first publication on it because that's what's valued. Um, so, well, there's a culture of not sharing too much. And another thing is lack of training. Uh, well, you need good skills on how to program for sharing to know what platform to use, what license to connect with. Um, not having the skills may, may make people unsure. They may think that their coding, their codes might, might have some bugs. They don't share it. So these three things are really the main items for having a community where the research software is locked. Well, taking back um, the view on science around me, around us. It's in transition. Um, I already mentioned that. But hey, still, if we look at what happens around us, who does recognize that we still have an increased competition in research grant? There's more research grants, there's more researchers, there's more funding for research, but there's also a lot of competition. Individual prices at all levels, at group level, at institute level, at national level, international level, they're all very prestigious, meaning a system where individuals are um, recognized and which nourishes a, in, like um, a way not to share. Because if you keep things for yourself, hey, you may be recognized. 
publishing, well, still it is a lot of focus on publishing papers. Uh, a rat race on numbers, I call it. I know things are changing a bit, but still there's an increase of, pay of journals that appear, a predator journals appear, journals that chase uh, APC, uh, uh, article processing charges. There's journals that have primary targets on short publication times instead of quality. And a look on my mailbox from last week shows that I had around 10 emails uh, with invitations to organize um, a special issue, to write a paper, to um, in being invited for special issues. So there is an, there's an, I'm over asked, we as scientists are over asked to contribute on journals. At the other hand, we see, well, in contrast to this um, um, journal paper based system, we have research data and software with direction on how to manage that. So it's get, getting more clear on how we should do that in a proper way. There's discussions around it. There's calls for open science projects. There's open science awards, team awards. Um, there's increasing number of scientific journals that offer to share data, to share software. There's the introduction of the CFF format that makes software citable. And of course, the DORA, um, that is the basis of record rewards and recognition. There's of course much more, but this is a glimpse of, we are still having these two worlds. And it's now that these that we are making the change, and I'm really happy to be part of of this change, which of course always is in dialogue. It's not a black and white thing. Of course, well, the the scientific publications remain very important, and it's not that I'm advocating on only sharing data data and software. But it's very interesting that we that these things all happen right now. Okay, my work right now. Um, so since 2019, when I when I noticed all those barriers, I actually have a three level approach right now. So first and foremost, we develop still research software. That's the core of what we do. Um, currently, we have a project. I will I will tell you soon. Um, I work on a community. Um, so I have a project on research on creating a community on open research software and acoustics. And I work on training and the culture shift. So if I zoom in on those three things, on the research software, I have a project um, to accelerate software. It's with eSign Center. So we have an acoustic software. It's a different type of software than you have seen before. It's a DG software. And we are accelerating that together with eSign Center. So these are things that we, we are doing still in our research group. It's the core of what we do. On the community, um, I have a project together with a colleague here in Eindhoven, Professor Alec Alexander and Sarah Brinick. It's about um, creating a community around open source software in acoustics with all the stakeholders. So that's the contributors, the acousticians, is the commercial parties that have an interest to branch the open source software into commercial products. It's the users the, in industry, in consultancy, and it may also be contributors to this open source software. This project just started and I'm really excited about it. I really hope that this is a start also internationally to create this platform, this community. And we have good examples. Open Foam, for example, is, in, is, is, in a, is a good example in the Fluid Dynamics community, which has, has I think, seen more than 15 years of development already. And the third thing, is that I'm working with my team. Here you see a picture of my research group last year when we went together on a coding workshop for a couple of days. And this is where I have my eScience fellowship project um, on. So I'm developing a plan for the group around training. So I strongly believe we need to train our researchers up to the new standards of sharing research software in order to create a culture change. So I've made a plan and together with the training elements that eScience Center is providing, um, I will train the researchers, including myself, on like getting new habits on not only doing research and publishing that, but also on in this in that same pace, sharing the software in a good way, maintaining that, 
and 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 working on the community. So if I look to uh, to the barriers that I've shown before, um, well, how can we unlock them? I think we all we can do that, and we need to do that all together. So the incentives, the lacking incentives, well, they are incoming. As I already said, software can be licensed, can be cited. Um, software gets valued in research assessments, so you can mark it as a, K, as, a, as a KPI. Open Science Awards arise, the recognition and reward system in universities, and also in grant writing, it gets, it gets like rewarded. The cultural thing, well, when, when developing open software communities, it gets more and more attractive for people to contribute that. It's the development and the growing of these communities that also influences cultural change. Developments of platforms like the RSD is very important because they make software accessible and they help people on, on changing their habits. And the lack of training, we need training modules. I'm doing that at a very small scale in my group. We need that on a bigger scale and on an institute level, on, an, on a university level. All research that we train should get this training. And as I said, we all contribute and we all can contribute somewhere to, uh, to make this change happen. Thank you very much for, uh, for your attention. Thank you so much, Varta, for a wonderful talk. Um, I think we have some time for questions. Um, so if you have a question, I don't see questions for Marta in the chat at the moment. So if you have a question, you can just raise your hand. And in the meantime, we did get a question um, from Chris Erdman in the chat. Uh, which is more of a general question. Um, he's wondering whether we um, have a public roadmap of features we're working on or thinking about for the directory. Thanks also for your compliments. Um, so I think Jason will be able to um, uh, give a better answer to that. But uh, in general, yes, we so we will put our um, new milestones and, and plans on GitHub. Um, but as we're sort of finishing the year, um, at the moment, there's not so much left on it because we were working towards this launch. Uh, we will definitely start adding new uh, features and plans um, in the new year. Yeah, indeed. So if I can add to that, you, um, I was actually, um, I was I was typing the answer in the chat. <laughs> you interrupted, interrupted me or faster. Uh, so indeed, we will have a roadmap uh, early next year. Um, we don't have an exact one at this moment, but topics that we will include are, for example, improving the findability of software uh, in the RSD, uh, having support for communities that actually allows you to, to uh, um, have a community specific view of the software that's available, uh, improving the data exchange with other um, uh, services in the open science ecosystem. Uh, and also very important to us, um, uh, coming up with a good plan for the long-term uh, sustainability of the research of directory itself, uh, because of course we need to be able to support it in the long term, uh, and that's also one of the things that we'll be looking at uh, in the in the coming year. So. Okay, uh, Chris, I hope that answers your question. And Chris has uh, put another question in the chat for Marta. Um, so, Marta, are you looking uh, to collaborate on your community of practice? Yeah. Um, so, so first of all, I think we are. We will also look for examples, yeah, because we 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 are um, developing this community in a certain research field in in acoustics, and it could be like spread out a bit, but we look also what others have done in communities and what what would help us. And of course, we are looking for collaboration. So if, if there are people that work in other fields that have ideas or suggestions or want to talk about things, then, then I'm really open for that. And also on the community that we develop, we also look for collaboration because that is what we need to get this community going for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Um, 
Thanks again, Marta. I think there's no more questions at this point, but um, oh, here there are actually a few more, and we have a few minutes left. Um, can you see the questions also, Marta? Yeah, I see them. Um, so I have a question from Luke, or it's more a comment. Um, would be nice to connect this to the work of open science communities in the Netherlands and abroad. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks for the comment. I will also write it down um, because I, I really like this. As I already mentioned, I like this era because there's so much initiatives and things coming up and going on. So it's really nice to see and to connect to, to those things to, and to learn from each other. And so I will write it down. The other is how to deal with continuous updating of software in relation to sharing. Um, yeah, I think this is um, maybe something that can be answered by, by the eScience Center because this is strongly related to uh, the citation uh, files. I don't know if there's someone from eScience Center here that can answer that. Otherwise, I, I can, of course, uh, try that. But maybe Jason could do that, for example. Yeah, maybe Jason, do you want to give it a go? Yeah, certainly. So indeed, one of the, the big issues with, uh, with with sharing software or citing software in general is that software tends to change quite heavily over time. Um, if you look at data sets, they tend to well be more stable and it, it, it tends to be easier to sort of cite a specific version there. Uh, I, I do think that um, specifically for software citation, there are already methods out there that allow you to cite software in such a way that you can both cite the software as a whole uh, and cite specific versions that you actually used in your in your experiments. Uh, citing software as a whole is, of course, important for uh, getting recognition, so recognizing the, uh, the contribution that the people that made the software has, uh, had, uh, uh, have actually made to, to research. Uh, while citing a specific version is something that's important to make sure that you can also reproduce the results which were uh, created using that software. Um, so I think it, it, it is more complicated than citing publications or citing data, but there are certainly solutions out there already that we can use that, uh, that solve these issues. Uh, there's two more questions. Shall I stop sharing, Maike, then I hope then... Yes, um, yes, if you can stop sharing, then yeah. Jason can already put uh, his slides on and then uh, we have time. Yeah, if you could still answer, can I answer them. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah you one... questions. Yeah, yeah. So, um, join you. Uh, sorry if I don't pronounce your name correct. You have two comments or two questions. One is, uh, do you know how your software have been cited? Well, there's this CFF uh, format that, that eScience Center has developed together with another institute that, that makes it possible uh, to cite. But one comment related to that is that uh, in my community, and maybe others recognize that, is if people have software that is that they publish, they often have a paper together with it. So it has been like quite common in my field that people say, hey, if you use my software, please cite my paper. So there is also a culture change that we have to do. So not instead of sharing the paper, if you use the software instead of using the theory behind it, but just using it, citing the software. So that is something that also has to shift. Uh, and another is the question about the Carpentry Institute on collaboration. I didn't know about that institute. It's a very good suggestion. I, I will look at, at it and may maybe, maybe it's very helpful for us. Thank you. There's one other question, Micah, I would really like to answer. Yes, Is that possible? Please, yeah, please go yeah. ahead. That's, that's um, from uh, Italo. It actually, leads to everyone. Um, the question is, how to deal with the quality of software? Do you th think a review process can be applied also before publishing the software? I think it's a really good question that really needs much more time than we have now. But one thing, because I recognize this question also for others, but I think one thing... Um, one answer to that is that the, the, the software that you find, for example, the people share on GitHub, which is not reviewed, you should also regard it as that. And so if you, there are communities, I think in the math community, that people um, share preprints of papers before they're published. So you should, should could consider like those software as a kind of preprint software, unless people already have like done a lot of um, validation steps, but for sure, this is one of the key topics on how to review software. You are uh, muted, Mike. I think you are 
give you Thank the you. floor, right? <laughs> <laughs> I was thanking part again for his answers and giving you the floor. Yes. So next up is uh, Jason Master, the technical lead um, of the uh, research software directory. I can mute myself. Um, yes, so thank you, Mike. Uh, like you said, my name is Jason Maasen. I'm one of the technology leads at the Netherlands eScience Center. Uh, very much involved in the development of the research software directory, but uh, today I will actually be representing uh, the many teams that have been working on the research software directory in the past years. Um, so sort of before we start, uh, a little bit of motivation, but I think already Martin explained this perfectly. Uh, so research software is a very important scientific tool, scientific instrument uh, in, in this moment in time. If you look at many of the breakthroughs that we've seen over the years, things like gene sequencing, climate modeling, radio telescopes, particle accelerators, you name it, they all critically depend on research software. And if you look at the Nobel Prizes, for example, to take a really sort of um, 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 extreme case, uh, for the last five to 10 years, every year you can sort of point out at least one Nobel Prize where you can really say, okay, research software played an essential role here. But like Martin already explained, um, unlike publications, unlike data sets, research software is often not recognized as proper research output yet. That means that researchers and research software engineers actually developing the software and sharing it do not get credit for this work. And it also means that it's very difficult to evaluate the impact that this research software has uh, on other research out, uh, activities and, and research outputs. And that is the reason we started building the research software directory. So this is what we want to change. We want to be able to show the impact that research software has on both research and society. We want to ensure that researchers can actually find research software that's relevant to their work and reuse it instead of building new research software all the time. We want to encourage proper citation of research software in other research outputs so that researchers and research software engineers actually get the credit <clears throat> that they deserve. And also very important to us, we want to be able to share the metadata we collect about research software as part of the open, open science ecosystem. So what are all the links between research software and the many other research outputs? Now, of course, we're not the first registry out there. We're not the first directory out there. If you look at um, um, sites like uh, ASCL or, or BioTools, uh, or even sites of institutes like KBLAB, which we have in the Netherlands, um, there are many different registries out there, sometimes already for a, a very long time. And the main difference between the research software directory and those other uh, registries is that we really try to show research software in its context and also provide organizational overviews of what research software is be being created. So what does this actually mean, research software in context? What kind of context do you have if you look at research software? Well, of course, you start, if you think about research software, you start by a piece of, with a piece of soft code, uh, source code somewhere. Um, hopefully, this is in a repository somewhere like GitHub or GitLab. Uh, hopefully, there's some documentation and testing. Um, but essentially, the source code is sort of the start um, of, what you, of the story you, you are trying to tell. But of course, this is only part of the narrative, right? Besides this software, there are also publications that actually describe the software in more detail and explain what it actually does. There may be publications that are made possible by this software, right? That could only be created because of the simulations or the analysis that this software has done. There may be data sets that actually were being produced by the software, projects that critically depend on this software to actually get the results that they need. Um, there can be many presentations, blogs, tutorials, videos, et cetera, et cetera. And also very importantly, there's usually a community around this software. So for example, you can have multiple organizations being involved in the development of the software, um, but often you also have multiple people being uh, involved in the development of the software. And these contributors, these can either be software developers themselves or researchers contributing to the source code, but of course, this can also be community managers or data stewards or software stewards contributing to this software. And all of this information is essentially the context living around this research software. 
and also um, um, gives you an, an opportunity to show the impact that this research so far has had on both research and society. Um, sort of collecting all of this information and presenting it in a proper way uh, is quite hard, right? If you would try to collect all of this information in your GitHub repo, for example, it can be done, but it, is, it takes a lot of effort. And that is actually the reason that we created the research software directory. So the research software directory is designed to collect this type of information and present it in a structured way. And by uh, because of the way that we present it, this enables research software engineers or researchers to show the impact that the software has on research and society. It allows organizations to collect information about the research software out, uh, output that they produce in the research projects that they're doing. It helps researchers to actually find the research software they need to do the research. And we also encourage the citation of research software in other research outputs, uh, such that uh, researchers and RSEs actually get the credit that they're due. So how do we actually present all of this information in the research software directory? Well, what you see here is a single software page. Um, at the moment, I think we have over 250 of these pages already in research software directory. And this software page has a very structured way of actually presenting all of this information. Now, it is quite a lot, a lot of information. So what you see on the left side here is the full page. And in the middle, I've actually zoomed into a certain section to show you what kind of information is on those pages. Now, for starters, we have sort of the basic information, uh, things like the name of the software, a short description, uh, maybe a detailed description or an, an itemized list of what it can actually do, things like keywords, programming languages you use, what kind of license it, it, it is using, and um, a link to some source code repository, for example, GitHub or GitLab. But this is only the start of the information that we present. Um, so we also have information about, for example, the community, right? We have things like a contributor count, and we'll get back to that later, um, a list of participating organizations, um, and for example, a, a graph showing the development activity, which is usually quite interesting because if, if you're looking for software, you really want to know that this software is still alive and still being maintained. What we also have is a, is a mention count, which brings me to, oh, Almost, uh, <laughs> I will actually explain that later on. So one of the main items here on the top of the page is actually the citation information, right? What we really want people to do is if they are using research software developed by other researchers or research software engineers, that they actually cite this information properly in their papers or other research outputs. Um, and on the research software directory, you really have this um, 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 section, which is this highlighted section at the top of all of the pages that explains to you how you can cite the software and allows you to download the citation information for every version of the software that has been released. If we scroll down a bit, we go to the mention section. Uh, mentions are essentially research outputs or other outputs, it doesn't really matter that are somehow related to the software. So those, these can be things like publications, conferences or journals, it can be presentations, books, videos, but it could also be news items, for example, or interviews. And what you can do with the research software directory is that you can collect all of this information uh, in the research software directory and it will be presented in a very structured manner. So the mentions will be grouped per type, for example, all the journal publications go together or the presentations go together, et cetera. And you're also capable of um, uh, showing certain highlights. So if there are certain items that you're proud of, you can actually show those prominently on the page. Now, a visitor actually visiting one of these pages can click on one of these groups, for example, the journal articles, and then get an expanded list of all the publications that are uh, registered with this software, with links going out to all of the different uh, paid, uh, um, websites of publishers that actually uh, show this, uh, this paper in more detail. If we scroll down a bit more, we have a section for user testimonials, right? For some research software, the amount of publications is not that high, 
uh, but it could be that they still have a, had a major impact on a certain user group. And then using testimonials is a very nice way to actually uh, allow people to um, well, give a quote and, and tell them what they thought about the software. Um, the next section, and one of the most important sections, is the list of contributors. So this list of contributors has the names, um, the ORCIDs, the, the affiliations, the roles, etc., of all of the people involved in actually uh, creating this software. Now, especially the role is very interesting because if you look at um, source code repositories like GitHub or GitLab, these typically list the developers, but they don't typically list people like community managers, data stewards, software stewards, etc. And in the research software direction, you can add the people that you have that you think have had an important role in creating this software uh, and actually specify specify what this role was. Um, you can also um, highlight a contact person if you want to, um, because usually if, if, if people are using software, it's nice if they know who to contact if they have questions. Now, if we then scroll down a bit further, um, we see a list of related projects and also a list of related software in the RSD. And then specifically the list of projects is sort of an other way of showing impact of software, right? Some software is typically never cited, but used in many projects, while other software is used in many publications, uh, uh, um, but not in that many projects. So by, by supporting both the mentions and the projects list, you can show different types of impact. Now, collecting all of this information is actually a lot of work. So what we try to do in the research software directory is automate as much of this as possible. So to create one of these software pages, and I'll actually show, show this to you in the, uh, in the demo session at the end of this, uh, this event, um, what you can do as a user is you can create a new software page. And then as a user, you need to provide the basic information. So a name, a short description, relevant links to, for example, GitHub, maybe some uh, persistent identifiers, and that's pretty much it. And then for much of the other information related to the software, we can harvest this automatically from all kinds of different sources that are out there. So for example, from GitHub, we can um, harvest information such as the programming languages, the license, the commit activity, and even the readme if you want. While from other sources, um, for example, Crosshef or DataSite, we can uh, harvest all of the uh, relevant information about mentions. Uh, and the only thing you need to provide is a DOI. So by automating this as much as possible, um, we actually limit very much the amount of effort it takes to create one of these pages. So once you've collected all of this information, the research software directory uses this to generate software pages. And what it can also do is generate project pages. Um, I won't go into detail there, but it suffices to say that with much of the information that we've collected, um, you can also generate uh, pages about research projects in blood instead of research software. What's also interesting is that because we have information on which organizations participate in developing research software, we can also generate a um, organizational overview, which takes me to the next topic. So what's good to say is that the research software directory is actually an online multi-tenant service. That means that it's not. Uh, that means that multiple organizations can actually use the research software directory to showcase their software. Uh, you don't have to download it and install it and maintain it yourself. Instead, you can just get an account in researchsoftware.org and then use that to actually collect all of the information that you want to collect. And multiple organizations are already doing this. So what you see here, for example, is the page of. Um, Utrecht University, who is already putting software into the, um, into the research software directory. Uh, and by going to the organization's page and clicking on Utrecht University, you can see exactly which software they are involved in. Now, if you do want to host your own research software directory, you can. And a very good example of this is the research software directory that's being hosted by Helmholtz. Um, who are actually actively working with us to develop uh, this, uh, this online service. 
Um, but they have their own instance of the research software directory. Uh, and in this instance, they actually collect all of the software being created in the different Helmholtz institutes. Uh, and Christian will actually explain this in a bit more detail in one of the later uh, presentations. Now, of course, if we have multiple research software directories, it is very logical to ask, hey, doesn't it make sense to actually start federating this? And th this is actually one of the th ideas we have for next year. Um, if we have multiple research software directories running in different locations, can we actually come up with a, a meta directory that actually collects all of the information from the different instances and presents a unified global view of this? But this is future work. Um, as I mentioned before, it's very important to us that the data that is being collected in the research software directory stays open and is available to the world. Right? Much of the data that's in there um, um, is, is open data already, and it's not our data, it's your data. It's the data of the people that are actually registering their software in, in the research software directory. So to actually share this data, we already have a couple of different mechanisms. Uh, at the moment, we have a REST API that you can use to actually query the data in the research software directory and also get data out of it. We have sort of an experimental um, way of, of sharing data from the research software directory in uh, institute websites uh, using page embedding, uh, which we're actually using at the, uh, at the Netherlands eSight Science Center itself to get an overview of the software and projects of the eScience Center in our uh, institute website. And what we're also doing is we're exchanging data with other services. Uh, and a good example of this is NASIS, which is the um, uh, sort of the archive of scholarly output in the Netherlands. And NASIS actually harvests the information in the research software directory uh, every day. And all of the data that's in the research software directory can also be found in NASIS. Okay, so that's really sort of a, a really quick overview of what the research software directory does, um, what features it has. Now, of course, the question is, how can you use it? And there are essentially three ways of using it. Um, the easiest one is to just go to researchsoftwaredirectory.org and browse the content, right? And maybe find software that's, that's actually useful for your research. But what you can also do is you can sign up uh, to actually become a contributor to the research software directory. And there are basically two ways of doing this. One way is that you can sign up um, as a individual developer or maybe a small team to put your software in there. And the other way is to actually sign up as an organization and also get sort of the organizational uh, views of the research software directory. And in the demo session um, um, at the end today, I will actually talk about this a bit more. Um, you're not the first organization to sign up if you do so. So we've already been working in the last year with um, a number of digital competence centers in the Netherlands to see how the research software directory actually fits into their organization, uh, specifically the one in Utrecht, uh, University in, Leid of Leid uh, in Leiden and Amsterdam UMC. Um, and this project was actually funded by SURF. Um, and Martina will actually in the next presentation talk about this a bit more um, about the ex her experiences in Utrecht. Um, of course, these are only the first organizations, so we would also really like to get your feedback. Um, things you can think of is how do you think the RSD could fit into your organization, or if you're an RSE or a researcher, would this actually work for you? Are you missing any features? Uh, can we automate things further, et cetera, et cetera. Which also brings me to the next slide. So the research software directory itself is an open source project. So at the moment, it's mainly being developed by the eScience Center and Helmholtz, although there are also uh, a number of external contributors already. So if you're a developer and you actually want to contribute, then contributions are always welcome. And you can contact us uh, on GitHub and um, I'll see how you can contribute. Now, before I finalize my presentation, I would like to say thank you to all of the contributors that have been involved in developing the research software directory over the years. Um, we started in 2017. You actually see a really old design of the research software directory here, which dates back from November 2017. Uh, and what's interesting to see is that it still looks very much like the software pages we have today. 
Um, since then, many people have been involved in creating the research of the software directory, coming up with ideas. And I would specifically like to thank Julian Sparks, who has been uh, um, instrumental in getting to, be, to, uh, to where we are today. Um, this is the current team of the research software directory. So also a big thank you to the current team, uh, specifically Dusan, Evan and Jesus, who, who made the current service that we are launching today. And of course, Maike for uh, managing the team and also doing a lot of community management. Now, in addition to this, there have been a lot of contributions from, uh, from Helmholtz. And I would like to uh, specifically thank Christian, who's uh, been uh, very much involved in the development of the research of the And of course, the various people of the digital competence centers that we've work, worked with in the last year to, uh, to actually test it for, uh, for users outside of the design center. And with that, I think that concludes my presentation. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, the research software directory is now open for business. So if you go to researchsoftwaredirectory.org, you can sign up. <laughs> and um, of course, you can also wait until the demo session at the end, where I will actually give you a bit more information on how you can sign up and how you can enter software. And that is my presentation. Are there any questions? I see we have lost the chat. Where is it? <laughs> Thank it's, you, it's Jason. Gone. Uh, and congrats to the team uh, that the uh, RSD is now officially um, open. There is. Um, so there's uh, lots of questions coming uh, through in the chat. Uh, we have um, to keep to the schedule. We have time for one or two questions uh, and the rest, perhaps you can try to answer also. Um, uh, we can try to answer uh, during the event. Yeah. So um, I picked a few out. There was a question from Jose who said, uh, well, thank you, congrats, looks great. How many? Ma how much manual input and curation is, uh, there is to keep it so neat? And there were a few more comments on that uh, right. that were similar. Uh, so another one was from uh, Jao Castro. Um, how do we get uh, for this manual input? How do we get engagement uh, for people to add that manual input? And is it possible to uh, automate that somehow? Yeah, okay. So what we've tried um, to do in the research software directory is automate as much as we can, but of course uh, there's always more we can do. So at the moment, and that's also something I will show in the demo, um, if you have all of the information available, you can create one of these software pages in just a couple of minutes, because essentially what you need is a title, a short description, some links, a collection of DOIs pointing to mentions, and, and then you're almost there already. It does depend a bit on, on whether you are following some of the best practices that, uh, that you see in research software development. Um, so, for example, if you're using a citation CFF file and if you're actually archiving your software in Zenodo, for example, then we can use all of this information to automatically retrieve uh, versions, retrieve uh, contributors, retrieve keywords, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I will actually demo this in at the end of this session. Um, of course, this is not the case yet for for everyone. Um, so it depends a bit on how much you have set up your, your entire workflow of, of, of developing software to, um, um, to how much we can actually automate this. Um, one of the things we are considering is that what, what you sometimes see is that people actually can add special files to their GitHub or GitLab repositories, for, for example, containing some of this information. Uh, at the moment, there's not really a standard to do that yet, uh, but we could actually go in that direction and try to automate it even further. That we can just gather all of the information from uh, uh, from GitHub or GitLab. But I do think that it's it's yeah, it's likely that there will always be a human in the loop somehow. Um, there's also questions. I want to pick out one more before we take a quick break. Uh, there's one from Nicola. Are you aware of BioTools Registry for Bioinformatics Life Sciences software? Are any plans to data exchange with them? And there's some other comments on other yeah. platforms. So I think this is a more general question. 
Yeah, absolutely. So I, I'm, I'm very much aware of them, uh, indeed. And there's also ASCL for the uh, astro astrophysics community, for example. So you, you see that there are several of these registries out there that, that are more specific, for example, for a certain domain. Um, I would be very much in favor of being able to somehow exchange information with those, uh, uh, those registries, right? So, so what we really want to do is have sort of an ecosystem of these platforms actually exchanging information and um, uh, somehow making all of this uh, uh, much more findable and, and searchable for uh, for researchers. Um, so, I think in that that ex that sense, it it. it Makes a lot of sense indeed to uh, uh, to connect to them and to see how we can actually uh, exchange information with them and also learn from them because I think especially in the area of metadata they've uh, they're a bit further along than most of the others. Thank you, Jason. Just looking at the program at the time, uh, let's take a five minute break now. Um, and just remember, we'll try to keep us answering questions via the chat, and at the end, there's also still Q&A sessions. Okay, so we'll see you back uh, 10 past 3. Hello, everyone. We're starting again. Um, in the meantime, so our next speaker is Martina. Martina, you can already start um, sharing your screen while everybody um, is joining again.
Let's see. Is, I think, are most people coming back? Well, we'll just start again. So next up, next speaker um, is our collaborator Martina de Vos uh, from Utrecht University. Go ahead, Martina. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear okay. you. Okay. We... Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, my name is Martina de Vos. I'm working at uh, Utrecht University. And as Jason already mentioned, um, I'm working in a so-called uh, digital competence center. We don't call ourselves like that, but well, it's comparable, our group. And together with uh, partners from Leiden and Amsterdam UMC, we, are, we have tried out the research software directory and we gave some feedback. And today I would like to tell you more about um, our DCC and also how we view research software at Utrecht University and our experiences with the research software directory. So first um, on our university, um, oh. Sorry. yeah, uh, Utrecht is uh, yeah, it's quite a broad university with a, a broad range of domains. We have uh, science, uh, law, uh, geoscience, and social sciences, veterinary medicine, um, basically everything except for the medical uh, domain, because that's a different organization. And um, in addition to the, the um, to the faculties, we also have some central corporate offices like um, the information technology uh, services department, where our team is based, uh, the university library, and so on. And. Um, yeah, what I think is very important, uh, and that's what I'm also very proud of uh, in Utrecht, is that on a university level, the uh, sorry, on a very high level, the management is quite aware of the transitions that are happening in science and has also put um, policy and resources to increase and uh, improve, encourage these transitions. Uh, with two multi-year programs on open science and on FAIR software and data. It's called FAIR Research IT. So these are two different programs to help us uh, researchers um, in these uh, transitions. And it also helps us a lot as a research support that also the university management is aware of this and is supporting us. Uh, in fact, this is not the first uh, uh, research IT program. There was a previous research IT program and that led to the development of our team or our DCC. Uh, here you see our DCC, which is basically, yeah, it's not, it's not like a physical organization, but it's a virtual collaboration between um, our group of uh, research engineers, um, and colleagues doing infrastructure uh, data management system in the ITS department and also data consultants and experts from the university library. And together we uh, support all researchers from Utrecht University at all faculties. They can come to us with any question re related to data or software. So we help researchers uh, by providing information, uh, in form of uh, online guides, uh, training workshops on, for example, handling personal data, uh, reproducible code, um, introduction to R, to Python, but we also collaborate uh, with researchers in, in projects and um, provide hands-on support and uh, customized consultancy, or for example, um, we give them access to compute. Uh, um, we hand out compute credits, and uh, also we give access to this to our Utrecht University GitHub um, 
organization. So of course, GitHub is open to all researchers, but we especially established this organization to encourage researchers to put their software in an online versioning system and uh, be open with their software, share it with our colleagues. And we provide them with, um, yeah, readme documentation and also some nice examples. For example, you can see here the featured projects so they can see other colleagues showcasing uh, their research software and they, well, they can copy uh, this nice approach. So we are actually all already are doing a lot, but still, um, we don't really have an overview of, of who is developing the research software at Utrecht University and also what kind of software. Uh, so thankfully, um, my colleagues, Jonathan de Bruin and Annalena Lamprecht um, did an inventory or actually this inventory was um, performed by Kevin Kach, a master student. Um, he collected data from um, all research software that is developed at Utrecht University that is on GitHub. Um, he collected data on 823 repositories on GitHub uh, maintained or developed by uh, 145 individual researchers and 24 organizations. Um, because he wanted to also in his thesis, he wanted to see how this research software engineers can be supported and how this quality of the software can be, well, what it is currently, uh, what status and how it can be improved. Um, in the bottom, you can see uh, that his approach is semi-automatic, is also on GitHub. It's called Swartz. There's also a template available uh, uh, where you can afford, uh, you can also try this, this inventory on your own institution to see what kind of uh, research software uh, there is available. To show some of the findings of this inventory, uh, Kevin found that, um, well, to be expected that most uh, software developers are based at the science faculty, followed by geosciences. Those two contain uh, mostly individual researchers. Uh, we have also some teams or groups developing software, for example, in uh, humanities, the digital the humanities lab, uh, in social behavior, behavioral sciences, there is a special a web app team, but there's also a social data analytics team uh, related to the Odyssey uh, framework. And uh, the gray bar uh, in the university corporate offices, that's our research engineering team. Um, also this in inventory shows that um, Python is the most uh, popular languages, language, especially used by the science faculty, while R is mainly used in social sciences. Uh, Jupyter Notebook is also quite popular. And quite interesting is that you see also, for example, um, a lot of shell sh uh, scripts are used. And this is because um, a great part of the uh, repositories Kevin uh, found. They did not really contain software, but rather research scripts that are used to uh, yeah, run specific analysis or specific workflows. Um, yeah, he, he made a, a distinction between scripts and, and software. Um, he also found that half of the repositories that he collected did not contain a license. So um, about the research software directory, uh, we did try it out in our team and also with um, uh, research uh, software engineers from different faculties. And we really want to support uh, RSCs in our uh, university and we think a pragmatic approach would be best, also given the results of this inventory. 
uh, we do not expect that uh, all repositories will reach this level of maturity to be showcased in the research software directory. So we see um, a tiered approach with three stages. So at first we would like to encourage researchers to make their software, um, to place it in the, in the versioning and uh, put it in GitHub, preferably, of course, our Utrecht University organization. And the next step is to encourage researchers to make their software fair, add a license, uh, add proper documentation, make their software citable and put it in the registry. And then when it's applicable uh, and the software is mature enough and still used and up to reuse, then of course, um, showcasing it in a research software directory would be a very nice next step. Um, so uh, Jason already showed this uh, page of Utrecht University. We, we tried uh, the research software directory ourselves as an engineering team. We put uh, several of our packages in the, in the, in the directory. Yeah, it worked quite well. Uh, we did not put all our packages. Of course, we had some, yeah, some selection. Which packages do we want to showcase? Which uh, are fit to reuse? Yeah, I think this is a selection that every organization or every researcher has to make for him or herself. Um, and we think that uh, the RC is a very nice platform for profiling and showcasing what you have done, profiling your research. Uh, and I, I really hope, and this is also, I think, a, a challenge, is that uh, the RSC is also used to get inspired by the work of your colleagues and also uh, find software that you can reuse in your own project instead of only putting your own software there. So, and this is only, of course, size matters. I mean, uh, this only works if many people put their software in the research software directory. So there is there's really something to choose from and to select the nice uh, the nice packages. And in the future, it would be great if um, the RSD can also be integrated somehow with official uh, information systems like Pure, so researchers can put their software in the RSD and get official recognition for uh, their research um, outputs. Um, yeah, so this is uh, what I wanted to say. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Martina. Uh, and also, thank you for your collaboration with us uh, this year. It's wonderful that the, you know, the RSD is now in use for the biggest university of the Netherlands. Um, and we've had, uh, you know, uh, it was really good to receive all the input from your researchers testing it. Um, we have time for a few questions. Um, there was one from Liz Guzman about for Martina. I think Marta has also already put something in the chat uh, to answer. But perhaps Martina, you also want to give it some attention. This uh, writes, is the RDM support team somehow recognized at the academic level um, or other ways of recognitions uh, that benefits them for future career prospects? Uh, yes, we do co-author uh, publications. Uh, that happens quite uh, regularly. Yeah, other way of recognitions. I don't know how. <laughs> Of course, uh, people are, are, are happy. Um, we can see that uh, in, uh, during our collaboration, of course, but what could be other ways of recognizing? Yeah, well, I think for me and also for my team, I think that, that the greatest recognition is uh, the impact we see that uh, our work has on on science and on the, yeah, is that we actually see that um, without our collaboration, the project would be um, less impactful or maybe not even possible. 
So that is uh, doing this job is on itself is already a reward. Maybe that's the wrong answer. <laughs> I, I see a lot of other uh, questions. Many of them are being answered by our team. Um, I'm not seeing any other specific questions for Martina's talk. So we would have time for one more. Um, but in the meantime, Christian can already start with setting up his presentation. So I don't, I see a comment on this question from Chris in the chat. It could be helpful uh, to click on profiles of profiles where you can see contributions to software and roles. Yeah, that's a really nice idea. Yeah. Um, okay, then I will give the floor to Christian Meisen, our collaborator from the Helmholtz Association in Germany. And he's yeah, thank you very much. I think I have a technical problem. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> I am very sorry. Um, so you yeah, we see, see something at the moment, yeah? Yeah, we see your screen. There's there's, there's a, this bar, right? Um, bar. I, Can you move it? No, yeah. it is away. Oh. Okay, no worries. Okay. okay. Great. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, sorry for the short uh, irritation. Um, yeah, so my name is Christian Mason. Um, I am uh, very excited to be here as well. Um, it's been really a nice and exciting year um, in the past. Uh, and um, yeah, uh, so a few words about myself. So I am by trade a geoscientist um, and have been programming since school, I think. Um, and uh, during my PhD, I actually realized, wow, software development is so nice. I want to do this on a professional level. So um, yeah, since 2019, I changed to the East Science Center at the GFZ in Potsdam, which where I'm uh, yeah, working at. And um, yeah, I've been part of HIFIS um, since uh, I think almost two years now as well. Um, yeah, and it's an honor for me to be here uh, to represent HIFIS and Helmholtz today. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd like to share the ideas that we have in, in HIFIS and Helmholtz. Um, for those who haven't heard about Helmholtz yet, uh, I'd like to um, yeah, mention a couple of things. Um, so Helmholtz is a research uh, foundation um, comprising of 18 research centers uh, throughout Germany. And we have um, yeah, more than 43,000 employees um, that are yeah, distributed amongst the centers. And um, the values that we aim for, uh, especially in the context of research software, uh, our sustainability, open science, and good scientific practice. Um, and overall, Helmholtz strives towards a unified environment for research and uh, information technology that can be accessed from all the centers and also from partner institutions. And this um, is why the so-called Helmholtz incubator was uh, founded. Um, the, the aim of the incubator is to trans to accelerate the digital transformation in Helmholtz. And we have five platforms, um, each of which focus on a specific aspect uh, of the digital transformation. So we have HIDA, which is basically for training um, uh, scientists in data science. Um, and Helmholtz Imaging is dealing with uh, problems in scientific imaging, Helmholtz AI, uh, is uh, for the artificial intelligence. HMC, Helmholtz Metadata Collaboration, is, as the name says, for everything related to metadata. And then we have HIFIS. And uh, yeah, I am part of HIFIS. And our mission is to provide a seamless, high-performing IT infrastructure uh, within Helmholtz. And we have three competence clusters, the Cloud Services Cluster. Um, if you want to have a look, you can visit helmholtz.cloud. Uh, here we provide uh, all yeah, kind of services that can be used uh, within Helmholtz by every employee. 
And then we have the Backbone Services Cluster who are taking care about our login provider, the Helmholtz AI, which is also integrated into the RSD uh, and virtual private networks. And then we have Software Services Cluster where I am situated in. And we have yeah, four work packages. Um, the first work package, education and training. Uh, you pr we provide uh, yeah, courses, workshop material, so that research software uh software pardon uh, researchers get uh yeah their foot into into software engineering practices then we have the community work package where i am uh, the lead of and the uh, goal of the community package is to build and foster uh, communities uh, that support a cultural cultural change uh, when dealing with research software and one of our um yeah main uh fields of work is to, uh, the maintenance of a research software directory. And then we have consulting, which is a yeah, contact point for researchers. Uh, if they have any kind of problems related uh, to software development, um, and lastly, the technology work package, uh, which provide the technological infrastructure for our work. Uh, yeah, I would like to start with an example that um, somehow is from my point of view, summarizes many, many problems uh, that are related to research software in academia. And I think this is also why the research software directory was founded. Um, so uh, I discovered this uh, citation, I anonymized it uh, because I don't want to blame anyone, but it basically is that, uh, yeah, we did this and that using software, some product, and then they cited, yeah, there were two, two, two citations, um, which already looks actually quite good but if you have a closer look you'll see that the first citation is a yeah, peer-reviewed publication about some product and the algorithm that is behind it and the second one is a conference talk which is a bit newer uh, with some more yeah, features of some product and uh, yeah somehow this is really not satisfying and it i think it shows really from the level of the researcher all the way up to the journals and the reviewers that really have a lot of work uh, in, ahead of us to get uh, yeah research software into the minds of the of academia so uh, but, yeah citation is not the only thing that we see that is a bit often uh, so what is often also not really regarded that well is licensing so uh, it's an annoying topic for the software developers but if you want to publish your code you really should take care about this um, then if you yeah, handle metadata of software, maybe you will have already seen that the metadata that you receive is often incomplete or it's non-uniform, then software is really poorly discoverable outside of uh, scientific literature. And there's also no impact measurement, no proper impact measurement at the moment. Um, yeah, and all of this kind of summarizes that there is really a lack of acknowledgement in academia in general with research software and um, yeah this is where we at HIFI think uh, that the research software directory is actually the perfect tool to build upon uh, in order to address these issues um, and um, yeah this was the reason why I think it was about a year ago we contacted the Netherlands eScience Center and have been asking for collaboration and uh, since then it has been really like an exciting journey and I'm really glad that I'm on board. And uh, yeah, thank you very much to the team of the Netherlands eScience Center. It's been like really, really great cooperation. Um, yeah, so big thanks. Um, yeah, and we have uh, our own fork uh, that mostly uh, incorporates some corporate adjustments so that it looks uh, a bit more Helmholtz-like. And it's currently uh, available in pilot stage uh, on Helmholtz.software. And of course, we also contribute uh, to the upstream development uh, in the research software directory repository. Uh, currently, the research software directory is very powerful if you want to discover existing software or you want to promote published software. Um, but in Hefes, we have the vision that you, that you can actually go to do much more with the software directory. So um, we see a lot of potential, for example, 
to provide services to research, research software engineers uh, before they actually publish their, their software. And then after the publication, we see a lot of potential in evaluating the software. Um, before you, I go to the next slide, I need to make a little bit of a detour so you understand uh, what's happening in the next slide. Um, so there is a project called Hermes, uh, which is funded by the Helmholtz Metadata Collaboration uh, platform and the goal of Hermes is that uh, they want to automatically aggregate metadata uh, of a software repository and this is basically their main workflow um, and the idea is when you have your source code repository you trigger a pipeline via CD and then the Hermes workflow will um, collect all kinds of metadata within the repository and then aggregate it so it can be used to publish uh, the software. If you uh, want to know more about uh, Hermes, please have a look here at their web page. Um, they are uh, in full progress of uh, yeah, programming and finishing their uh, pipeline. Uh, and I think you can see them at the DERSE conference uh, next year as well. So um, yeah, we want to uh, integrate Hermes into the research software directory. Um, so if we have the repository here on one side and the software directory entry on the other side, uh, we think that we can use the output of Hermes together with uh, the metadata that we can already scrape uh, from the repository like uh, CFF files, licenses, um, the activity and programming languages to aggregate and harmonize metadata and prepare it so we can forward it to DOI minting providers. Uh, and I'm not specifically specifically thinking about Zenodo here, but we also have plenty of uh, DOI providers in Helmholtz, which have very different technical level um, uh, of how they process the data. And here it would be really helpful if we have a way to uh, unify the metadata that is being generated so it can be easily published by the DOI minting providers in Helmholtz as well. And then after publication, uh, we see that we have all the data in one, one place and this is perfect for impact analysis. So when we manage to uh, auto scrape citations, for example, from cross surf data site or dimensions, uh, we have a really, really good uh, foundation uh, to perform uh, impact analysis. Uh, yeah, that is, has been the topic in the chat earlier as well. Software heritage is a big topic, and I think uh, this should be considered here as well. But uh, yeah, I've, I've seen that it's already in the progress. Um, the next thing we would like to address uh, in, in the near future um, in Helmholtz is a license consultation. So um, yeah, I've mentioned it earlier that licenses are a, a quite an annoying topic for programmers, but that has to be dealt with. And uh, here at GFZ uh, in Potsdam, we have established a workflow where um, yeah, three experts, so lawyers, technology transfer and software engineers, have a look at incoming requests and help programmers uh, on finding their, soft, their proper license for their software. And uh, we think that here the RSD is coming perfectly into play because uh, this uh, consulting uh, group can could access uh, entries that are in the RSD but that are not published yet, and then directly communicate with the software engineer about uh, yeah what kind of improvements do they have to be made? Are there any corrections? Uh, do we need additional information? And then if everything goes well, the software engineers should have a proper license and can go ahead um, to the minting service. Another tool we see uh, that could be very helpful uh, in the RSD, and especially to increase the fairness of research software, uh, are software quality indicators. And uh, yeah, they would actually would be kind of a gamification because if you see uh, some kind of indicators that may look like these circles here that may really push the research software engineers to uh, yeah, improve their code base. And um, there are plenty of aspects that we could evaluate here. So from fair aspects like code quality, coverage, uh, test coverage, um, specific uh, real specification compatibility, 
what kind of license do we have? Is there any documentation? Um, and if we take these fair aspects together with the citations and mentions, and also project or commit activity, uh, com community activity, uh, yeah, we could effectively generate a really good quality indicator. Um, we've been uh, developing a toolkit which is called Software Quality Assurance. Um, this is a, so just as a side note, if you want to have a look, um, the slides will be distributed uh, later. You can have a look here. Um, this is our starting point for this kind of uh, quality indicators, and we are looking forward to hopefully integrating this um, in the future to the RSD. Um, to increase the visibility of research software, uh, HIFAS started the um, HIFAS or Helmholtz Software Spotlights. Um, these software spotlights are outstanding software projects that uh, yeah, are presented on the, our webpage at the moment on hyphas.net slash spotlights. And we have 30 spotlights online uh, and there are about 70 more on the waiting list. Um, this is how the, the software spotlights distribute amongst the research fields. So we have uh, these six research fields in Helmholtz. Um, energy, earth, environment, information, health, matter, and astronautics in space. Um, yeah, we see that it's actually quite nicely distributed, except for energy. I don't know what's happening here. Maybe I need to have a look. Uh, well, um, anyhow, the uh, Helmholtz Research Software Directory uh, will become the home of the spotlights in the future, in the near future. And um, we are actually planning to award prices to development teams uh, for outstanding software in several categories. Uh, these software awards, they are currently in preparation. Uh, we will have se yeah, these several categories, which are not really fixed at the moment, but we are looking forward to uh, handing out the prices by the end of the first quarter in 2023. And they will also be announced on the software directory, of course. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Christian. Um, that was a great talk. Um, and I just want to uh, emphasize again how wonderful it was to collaborate with you. So the Helmholtz Association has really contributed a lot to the development. Also, when you contacted us, uh, I think it was in April this year, and said that you wanted to have an internal version working in a few months i thought that would never be possible but we made it work the teams made it work um, and it has been a really uh, pleasant experience for everybody um, there are some questions in the chat for christian some have also already been answered um, the last one uh, does the hermes rsd oh is it also running um, on the e-science instance as well so i yeah christian can so, that. Um, yeah so at the moment hermes is uh is not finished yet they are still in the in the progress of uh finishing their pipeline but uh i see there there is no um obstacle that we could uh, integrate hermes into the netherlands eastside center rsd um so this has been the yeah the general approach in, in the last year so basically everything or almost everything that we uh, yeah need for the Helmholtz RSD we also integrated into the Netherlands RSD yeah oh. yeah and I think um, also the question of whether how how we can federate these different um, uh, RSDs becomes really interesting here again because for Helmholtz, it made sense to have their own separate instance. They are also such a big organization with all these research institutes. Um, but it would be really nice to exchange data again in these instances. I think, so there's a nice question from Anelda. Uh, I can maybe say something about that. Are the research software spotlights and prizes limited to projects from Europe? Or would it be possible for folks from other areas for example africa to be featured as well so i think that so currently the idea of the spotlights and prizes that's what helmholtz is planning to do um so that is for really uh the helmholtz uh, the software for, from the the helmholtz uh institutes but um the e-science rsd team thinks this is such a wonderful idea that we're also thinking about doing something similar 
And because our platform is the multi-tenant international platform, that would then, yeah, be uh, for any software that is on the platform. Um, and then there's another question from Super Mario. Um, are there plans to have a single international instance? Uh, so that relates also, I guess, to the Federation, but I'm going to give that one to Jason. Yeah, so I already answered to the chat. So um, I'm, I'm, there are sometimes reasons to have for organizations to have their own uh, instance of the RSD, and um, I think that's fine. Um, having an international instance, it, it depends a bit on how you how you see this question. So I think it, it, to me, it would make sense to also federate these different copy uh, these different instances so that you can have sort of a global view of all of the software in all of the different research software directories out there, and maybe even in other systems like BioTools or, or uh, ASCL, which was discussed earlier. Um, I think uh, the version that we are hosting um, is, is, is also open to international organizations or international developers. So we already have a lot of contributions, for example, coming from, from Canada in our, in our research software directory. So if the question is, uh, can I, as an international um, um, developer of research software, also join the research software directory? The answer is uh, yes, you can join uh, ours today if you want. Uh, so that's not an issue. And uh, I just quickly checked uh, our inbox and there are already uh, some people and organizations signing up during the event, so that's really great. I see a hand from uh, Uwe. Go ahead, Uwe. Yeah, thanks a lot for the nice talks today. Uh, just a remark, because there was a discussion uh, recently with the university colleagues, so very often it, it seems like it, there would the only acknowledgement is uh, publication or papers or so peer-reviewed papers but that's not true prizes and awards are, are very common in in science you know a Nobel prize of course the best one but they are really a lot and uh, so applying such an award here for software is uh, maybe really helpful and and is it it it's more value also for the research deck directory because it's the starting point hopefully but overall we try to establish that as a brand this prize and uh, I today I received good feedback so I think we are, are on a good way to really establish that that uh, award software software award thanks you yeah, over um I'm looking at the program so are there any other comments um or questions for Christian's talk If not, I would again uh, like to thank the speakers uh, for all their great presentations. Um, we have some time for uh, general questions, comments uh, that can be asked live. If you feel like you've posted a question in the chat, for example, that hasn't been answered yet, feel free to, uh, to raise your hand and uh, ask. Have, have we missed anything? I'm just looking at our uh, moderators. Possibly we have missed something today. Well, I think uh, if there, there are no more questions at this moment, then we can move on to the demo and Q&A session. There's more uh, time for questions there, more opportunity. Um, and of course, you can keep posting things in the chat. So I will give the floor again to Jason, who is going to give a demo yep. of the RSD now. The insights of the RSD, yes, indeed. Uh, so let me share my screen again. Um, so you should now see the research software directory, what page, hopefully. Um, yeah, so what I would like to do in the next, what is it, 10 minutes or so, is, is to uh, quickly show you how you can add software to the research software directory. Um, in order to be able to add software, you first need to have an account because you need to be able to sign in. And as you may have already seen, I already mentioned it also in the presentation, 
is that there are essentially uh, two ways to sign up to the research software directory. You can either sign up as sort of an individual individual contributor of, or a team. Um, there's this button which you can click on. If you do so, you'll get an online form that um, uh, asks or a form that asks you, okay, what's your name, your affiliation. Um, uh, very importantly, your ORCID, because we actually use ORCID as a way to, for people to sign in. Um, and maybe any information you would wish to share with us on, uh, on, on what kind of content you would like to contribute. Uh, and if you then click on create email, you will actually get a pop up with your mail client that actually sends this email to us. So it's just a sort of a, for us a sort of standardized way of getting these requests all in, into one email uh, uh, mailbox. Um, you can also sign up as an organization. Um, this requires a little bit, little less information. So if you actually sign up this form, uh, then we will contact you uh, later this week or next week uh, and have a chat with you about, well, okay, which organization are you actually involved in? Uh, what would you like to do with the RSD, et cetera, et cetera. So there's uh, a bit more discussion um, involved in this one, but uh, don't worry, uh, you'll get access. That's not the problem. It's just that we need to see what the best way of getting access for you would be. Now, provided that you have an account on the research software directory, you can use the sign in button to actually um, uh, sign into the system. So of course, first of all, if you go to discover software, you get an overview of all of the, of the different software that is available on the uh, Marisha software directory already. Uh, similarly for projects, there's an overview for organizations, etc. But if you really want to add something, then you first need to sign in. And if I click on sign in, what you see here is that there are currently two different ways of signing in. Uh, one is ORCID, the other one is Surf Connect. Um, for those of you who don't know Surf Connect, so Surf Connect is um, essentially a, an identity provider that's used by Dutch uh, research institutes. So anyone in the Netherlands that um, works at a university or a, a hogeschool uh, or different research organizations can actually use Surf Connect to. Um, to log in to the research software directory, provided that their organization has actually switched this on. And therefore, it's important for us to first discuss this with the organization, because if you're using Surf Connect, then you can actually add software using your own um, organizational credentials. So the login from your, uh, your institute. This usually takes a little bit of time to arrange. There's lots of forms that need to be signed and that kind of stuff. Uh, so a much quicker way to actually get access is through your ORCID. Um, and ORCID is essentially a persistent identifier for researchers. It's often also required for, uh, for, for journal publications, for example. Um, and many researchers actually have an ORCID that uniquely identifies them on papers or data sets or other research outputs. And if you have an ORCID, you could also use this to actually log in to the research software. Um, now, if I would just sign in quickly using my Surf Connect, uh, then I can show you sort of the insights of the research software directory. So now I am logged into the system. And one of the things I can do is I can look at which software I'm actually maintaining in this system. Um, so for example, Xenon is one of the tools that, that, that I was involved in the development a long time ago. Um, and I can edit then the pages of, uh, uh, of this software. Now, of course, this is a page which is already completely filled out, right? So as you can see, there's lots of information here. And what I would, I, what I would actually like to show you is how to create one of these pages from scratch. So instead of doing this in um, the actual production version of the RSD, what I'll do is I'll go to the online demo, uh, which you can reach through, let me check. Where's the button? There's the button here. If you click on demo on our web page, uh, then you go to the documentation that actually shows you where you can find the online demo. And there's a different domain called researchsoftware.dev, which is essentially another copy of the research software directory, but this time one that anyone can use to just play around with and, and test whether or not this is useful for them. Um, so if you click on sign here, sign in here, you actually see that you get multiple options and the best option uh, for you to use is just to do a local account. So if you do a local account, you can come up with a username. It doesn't really matter. I can do a JM01, right? And then as soon as you click login, you're log logged into the system. 
And what you actually see here is all kinds of synthetic data. So we use this to, to, to test our, our, our system. Um, that doesn't really matter. What it comes down to is that anyone can actually get access to this system and, uh, and, and use it to, uh, to add software, uh, just to play around with it and see how it works. Um, if there are any questions, by the way, then please stop me because I, I don't see the chat uh, anymore. So I'm, I'm, um, I don't know what's happening there. So there, so, there, just in between, there was a quick uh, question yeah. about, uh, or I heard a warning message about ORCID only for invited persons. So maybe oh, yes. yeah. you explain that it's a whitelist. Yeah, true. So uh, of course, the, the issue with ORCID is that, that essentially anyone can make an ORCID. Uh, we would like to have at least some some check uh, who's actually accessing the research software directory. So if you uh, want to use your ORCID to log in, um, then you can use the form that I just showed you, uh, which is here, sign up to contribute. Uh, and then we'll get a message and then we'll just have a look, okay, uh, uh, what's your affiliation? Hey, what, what kind of research software do you want to add? And then we'll add you to the whitelist so you can actually use it to access. But it's, it's not the case that anyone with an ORCID can immediately access the research software directory. There is this uh, manual step by the administrators to, to give you an account, essentially. And then the first time you sign into the research software directory, your account is created. And then from there on, you can sign in with your okay. Okay, so let's add some software to the research software directory. So the way in which you do this is you click on the plus, click on new software, and then you get a form that says, okay, you want to add software, please provide some information. Now, of course, the quickest way of doing this is, is taking one I've prepared earlier, right? Like to do in all the cooking shows. Um, so what I will do now is I will add the information of one of the software projects that I've been involved in in the past. So this software is called SV, oops, that's the wrong one, sorry. Uh, this software is called SV Colors. Let me just go and paste this. Right, and what this software actually does, it does DNA analysis, right? So it can actually find structural variants or mutations in DNA, which may cause cancer. And it's a, a workflow that actually does this. So by providing a name and a short description, you could start creating the software page. Now, as soon as you've provided this information, you can see that you will end up in this, um, uh, this data curation interface where you have different sections of information you can add. The best thing you can do um, is if you have um, um, information available, such as GitHub or GitLab uh, repository, repository URLs or uh, DOIs of, of, of uh, software, which is archived in Zenodo. If you, were, if you add those uh, first, then we can actually use those to import a lot of different information. So for example, what we can do is we can take this one. So this is the location where uh, the software can be found in GitHub. And the software has also been archived through the Zenodo GitHub um, link. So if we actually add the DOI of the software also, what we can then do is say, okay, validate, is this DOI correct? Yes, indeed it is. We can import the keywords from the metadata that's in this DOI. And we can also import the license. Uh, and by simply importing all of this information from, from metadata that's already publicly available, it, it saves you a lot of work. Um, what's also nice to add is a place where people can start if they uh, want to start using the software. In this case, I'll just point to the readme in uh, GitHub. And you would like to have some text describing the software in a bit more detail. And one of the things you can do is just use Markdown, for example, to describe this. Now, if you look at this page, right? So if I click on the view page button, you see that there's already much of a uh, software uh, page available at the moment. It's not complete yet, but there's a lot of information already here. And some of the information like uh, the commit history uh, or the development activity is something that will be harvested automatically um, while you are editing the page. So if I continue adding information, um, the next field that I would like to add is contributors. Now, 
like the license information and keywords, I can actually import contributors from the metadata that's that's linked to the uh, the DOI that goes with the software. So if I click on import contributors, the contributors will automatically be imported. Now, sometimes you want to add some information to contributors. So, for example, uh, Arnold here is actually the lead developer. Um, so it's nice to actually give him a picture so that people know what, what Arnold looks like. Um, I can give him a role of lead developer and make him the contact person. And then, of course, I also need to provide some email address. Uh, address. Uh, let's see. Like this. And then save it. And then if you would view the page again, what you would see is that indeed now you have more information about the contributors. So you have different people being added. Uh, most of the people have an ORCID. For some reason, I don't. That's actually interesting. I should check why this is. Uh, but all of this information actually comes from the metadata that's already available in the DUI of the software. OK. Um, let me see. So those are the contributors. Um, the next step would be to add organizations that are actually participating in this uh, development of this software. Now, what we what you can do here is you can type the name of an organization in the search bar. Um, actually, here it's difficult to type, right? Um, and what we'll do is we'll actually look in the research software directory database, but also in the ROR database, which is a database that contains all research organizations that are registered globally, and find um, well the relevant hits uh, for a thing you're looking for. So in this case, I want to add the eScience Center. Um, it's not known yet, so I do need to add a logo because it wasn't in the database yet. And I think this was also uh, created by you. Medical Center, that's this one. That's also not in the database yet, so I also need to add a logo there. Save. So I've now added these two participating organizations. Um, I needed to add logos because they weren't in the database yet. As soon as they are found in the database, the, the logos are actually already added, uh, usually. Um, so this is sort of an extra step that you need to do for new organizations. And again, if I would view the page now, what you would see is that uh, these organizations are now added as participating organizations. What you also see here is that in the meantime, while we were adding the page, the citation information uh, of this software was also scraped in this, in, in this case from Zenodo. So now you can actually see the different versions of the software that are available and you can download for a specific version, let's say version 1.2, you can download the citation information in a specific uh, format that you could that you would like to use, like BibTeX or RIS or EndNote. If I would go back to the editing pages. So the next step is editing mentions, right? So adding publications or uh, presentations or other uh, research outputs to the software page. Uh, the easiest way of doing this is by actually just simply cutting and pasting DOIs, right? So if I would paste this DOI in the search bar here, it would automatically in Crossref find the uh, related uh, conference paper in this case, which I can then add and it will automatically be classified as a conference paper. Um, similarly, I can add DOIs for data sets. Let's see, is this the one? Yes. So this is a data set, for example. Um, I can add journal papers. Uh, let me see, I have an example here. Mm, there we go. Um, and uh, for example, also presentations. Um, so this, is, this one is a presentation. Right, and as you can see, if you just cut and paste DOIs, it's very simple to add uh, a list of mentions. What you can also do if you want to is actually search mentions by title. Um, so if I would just search for um, a certain name, in this case, a paper that I was involved in in the past, what I can do is I can actually add, for example, a computer program that has this title. And it searches in the, the data site and the Crossref databases to find uh, hits and also in the artist. 
It's also possible to add mentions that do not have a DOI. So for example, if you click on the add uh, or create mention without a DOI, you get an online form that allows you to add all of the information that's relevant to, uh, um, uh, to this mention. Um, for example, we've had a blog at some point about this software, which has this title, let me check. Right, this blog was created by, um, oops, bring us back. So I should add in here. Uh, it was created in, when was it, 2018? And it also has a URL, which is the blog that, uh, that's actually online, which I can add here. Now, one important thing that you need to select here is what kind of mention it is. Because you're doing it manually, we don't have the information on whether this is a publication or a book or a data set. And you can actually choose different types of, of mention here. And one of the special ones that I would like to highlight is highlight. Right. So if you select highlight as a, uh, a mention type, then you can also add an image URL, uh, which is actually added to the mention. So if I Place this here. Um, it's oh, sorry, let's replace this one. It should go there. Um, so now I've also added an image to this mention, and if I save it, you can see that this image also shows up here. If we go back to the software page that we're editing, you can see that already uh, the information coming from GitHub is, has been uh, harvested automatically. So there's now this graph that shows you uh, development activity. And now there's also this mention section, which actually shows you all of the mentions that I've added uh, to, this, uh, to this page. And if you would click on, for example, a uh, conference paper, then you would get uh, a link to the conference paper. And if you click on it, you actually go to the, uh, the journal that actually has this paper. So in this way, you can collect all of the different information um, uh, about this software. Let's see, is there anything else? Oh yeah, testimonials. So one of the things you can also add is testimonials. So you, you can have um, a quote from somebody saying, uh, uh, the best software ever. And I, I'm pretty sure I, I heard Michael say this at some point. Um, so if we then add this quote, and this will also show up uh, as a testimonial on the page here. Now, the final thing you can add is related topics. So you can search the research software directory for other information or other software pages that are available. Now, of course, most of the software in the develop or in this test uh, online test version is just randomly generated. Uh, so it all has really weird titles, but you can simply add um, a number of pieces of software and similarly, you can add projects um, as sort of related work to this uh, uh, to this piece of software. And if you would then go back to the view page, then you can see that you have sort of a completed page uh, that contains all of the information that you have available about this software, uh, including other pro uh, related projects that use it, uh, other tools that uh, somehow have something to do with it the contributors, testimonial mentions, et cetera, et cetera. So this is how you add software pages. Uh, like I mentioned before, you can also add projects to the research software directory. Um, if I would just show this quickly. Um, it's, very, it's a very similar way of actually providing the input. So you have an initial form and then essentially you have more information about the projects that you can add. I won't actually go into um, um, explaining this in any more detail, but uh, it, it's it's all uh, pretty uh, intuitive. Um, to get back to all of the software and projects that you have that you are maintaining in the research software directory, you can click on your your uh, avatar here in the corner, and if you go to my software, you'll actually go to your profile page that has information about your profile. It has all of the software that you are maintaining, and also all of the um, projects and organizations that you are maintaining. Um, one important thing I forgot to mention is that if you're actually editing software and you're happy with the page, you shouldn't forget to um, uh, set the published slider because as long as this isn't set, uh, other people cannot see this software. So as soon as you publish it, um, then what you can do is you can 
um, go back to the page, let me see. So if I would now log out and just search for the software in the RSD, then you can see that indeed this software is now publicly visible. And this is really like a crash course in, what is it? A couple of minutes on, on how to add software. So as you can see, it's, it's quite easy. We try to automate a lot. There is still some, some, some manual work uh, that you need to do. Uh, but especially if you have all of these uh, URLs and persistent identifiers DYs available, then uh, it's actually really easy and quick to uh, to create one of these pages. Um, yeah, so I guess that's it for the demo. Are there any questions? Um, let's see if there's... Let me stop sharing so I can actually see the chat again. <laughs> uh, Any questions? Um, I know it's it's a lot to take in. We also have um, documentation and a demo on the RSD website, as Jason also mentioned. So if you need to process and go back to that, that's possible. Okay, um, I think for the questions. Huh? So now for the questions, also feel free to uh, to ask them directly. So not in the chat, oh. but just raise your hand or speak up. That's so fine, of course. I see. There's a question from um, Mattia. Go ahead, Mattia. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I have a quick question that maybe I missed, and you said oh, sorry in that case. But uh, when you showed how to uh, sign up, you showed that we can sign up uh, to contribute or register our organization. Yes. Uh, in case our organization is not yet registered, should we first uh, uh, register the organization and then register ourselves, or we can just register ourselves? That is a very good question. So uh, we, we um, um, it depends on what your role in the organization is, of course. Okay. Uh, um, so what we see is that sometimes people uh, contact us that really represent organizations or like a digital uh, um, competence center or research support in the organization, and they want to sort of ena uh, enable the research software directory for their entire organization. But we yeah. also see quite a few individual researchers or research groups um or sometimes even faculties or departments that want to start using the RSD without the organization itself uh, already being involved. So, so this is possible. Yeah, as far as we are concerned, both are is fine. Okay. Uh, and I think that's also very much up to you what the situation is in your institute and to what extent you can already uh, start using it. And um, of course, what we would like to have in the end is that uh, we have both uh, individual researchers and research software engineers contributing their software and have different people from the organization sort of maintaining the organizational pages and also having the overview of what software is coming from the organization. Um, but these are sort of two different roles. So you can indeed add individual uh, uh, software if you want. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? Perhaps good to mention again, in case people missed it, uh, but you said it, I think. Um, so your organization doesn't have to be your top level organization. A research group can also be an organization or consortia can be an organization. So it's very flexible concept, a bit like yeah. in GitHub. Yeah. And I should know this, but do we now already have the possibility to nest organizations in other organizations? Yes, we do. So uh, we are not using it extensively yet, uh, but indeed it is possible to really register a top level organization like a university and then have sub pages for, for example, faculties, departments, etc. Um, so that is one of the features we have available at the moment. It is still in testing, so we want to test it as the, at the eScience Center first, uh, so to eat our own dog food first, uh, but it is something that, that can be done already. 
Uh, and the reason for doing it like this is that the top level organizations like universities or research institutes, they tend to be in the uh, relevant databases. So the ROR database, for example, they have persistent identifiers and it's very easy to sort of import information uh, from these databases. While if you are a specific department or a specific faculty within such an organization, then uh, you typically don't have your own identifier. And therefore, you need to do a little bit more manual work to add those. Um, so that's slightly different. But as you already said, um, we interpret the concept of organizations quite broadly. So it can also be virtual organizations like large infrastructure projects. Um, um, it, it doesn't have to be really a building somewhere. It, it, it can be a sort of a, well, a broad interpretation, interpretation of what an organization is. Any other questions? If not, I'd like to uh, thank our speakers again. Also, many thanks to our co-organizer, Lieke de Boer, and also our comms advisor, Veronica, for doing a lot of uh, communications around this event. Um, a huge thank you to the RSD team and also Many thanks to all of you, especially the ones that are still remaining until the end. <laughs> so it was really nice to have you here and to share this milestone with you. If you have any further questions, um, Evan has uh, posted our uh, email address in the chat. You can also find it on the website of the RSD. You can find the documentation there, demo. So you can always have a look around. Um, Yes, so I think if there's no further comments, then there's, oh, there's a, oh, yes, there's a, another question, right? Yeah, Mattia. Mattia. Did you have another question, Mattia? No, sorry, this was a leftover from the previous chat that was starting, uh, and uh, <laughs> then I asked ah, the question, so <laughs> not voluntary. <laughs> No worries. Okay. You answer okay. the question then. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of the afternoon and evening, and um, hopefully, we'll be in touch. Yes. Thank you. Bye. Bye, -bye. Okay, I think everybody, all the other participants are now either gone or thrown out by Lika. <laughs> <laughs> that is, uh, dankjewel, Maarten. It was a fantastic presentation. Yeah. yeah, it was echt heel fijn. And you bent gemute, maar. <laughs> yeah, really, really well done. Yeah, I thought I was going to wait for the end that you guys would. But yeah, it was super, super leuk om te doen. I must wel say that it wel. Anders is dan als je voor een zaal staat of zo. Hè? Dat online, ja. dat blijft toch wel. Ja. Je ziet mensen niet en je weet ook niet wie er zijn en zo. Maar ja, um, ja het was echt super.